was intense. <laughs> How about that intro video, eh? A little Stranger Things. Uh, that's uh, the product of Jordan Lewis, one of our staff members. Let's give it up for Jordan. Awesome. Yeah. And we can probably just give it up for the entire staff here, the worship team, everybody who is. Let's just give it up for staff. Yes. Awesome. Very blessed here at FBC to have some amazing people on the team. Very thankful. Well, hey, uh, recently... I was reading an article from Good Housekeeping Magazine, because that's my favorite uh, magazine to read from. And in this article, it suggested that the average person, the average American, should sweep their kitchen once per day. Now, I think that whoever wrote this article at Good Housekeeping probably doesn't have little kids. Because if you're anything like me and you got little kids, you have to sweep the kitchen constantly. Like, just... Anytime I go to sweep the kitchen, there's always something to sweep up in my house, right? After breakfast, kids have crumbs everywhere. You got to sweep up after breakfast. Uh, then there's snack, right? After snack, they make a mess everywhere. Then after lunch, they make a mess. Then after the snack after lunch, they make a mess. And then dinner, and then the snack after dinner. You get the point. It's just constant. We have just messes all over the, the kitchen all the time. Crumbs everywhere. Uh, that's just the way our, our kids are, which is probably why we have so many ants this spring. Anybody else have a lot of ants? In particular, yes, this spring, ants are everywhere. The ants love the Berkebeen household. They love it. They tell all their friends, right? Hey, let's go to the Berkebeens for lunch today. What's on the menu? I, whatever you want, man, it's all over the floor. So that's our house. We have ants. And so a couple years ago, I discovered this uh, ant bait that I started using. And if anybody's seen this before, it's, uh, there's this or other versions of it. Basically, this little plastic a container filled with sweet liquid. You break it open on one end, you set it on the ground, and then what happens is the ants, they are attracted to it, they go toward it, and then they, they eat this sweet liquid. And I assumed that when I first got this that the ants would go to it and then eat it and die. It's actually not how it works. It's pretty ingenious. So what they do is they go over to it and they eat and they keep eating and they keep eating. They fill their bellies with this little sweet liquid and then they go back to the colony and then they tell all their buddies, hey, this stuff is pretty good. Let's come try it out. And then they start feeding the queen some of this. And the ants can go back multiple times. It takes days for anything to happen. They'll, they'll fill their bellies. And pretty soon, all these ants are coming in your house. In fact, it attracts uh, more ants than you probably would normally have in your house, which may be concerned at first. I'm like, this is the opposite of ant poison. Like, more ants are now in the home. Well, that's the beauty of it. Right? They all eat up, and then what happens is, you know, they say, this is great, this food is good, it tastes good, it looks good, everybody's doing it, we're going to do it too. And eventually, over time, the ants poison themselves and they die. This uh, liquid has 5% borax in it. Borax is lethal to ants, and, and it's, it's subtle though, it takes time. It usually often takes, on average, like two days for an ant to die after eating this poison. So by that point, they've already consumed a bunch and they've spread it all around, and pretty soon, the entire colony is dead, and that's the beauty of this ant bait. Now, as I've been putting this out for the last couple of weeks and trying to take care of all the ants in our house because of the messy crumbs everywhere with the kids, it made me think of something. You know, in this world, there is something that is incredibly deadly and, and poisonous and toxic to the human race. In fact, this is a poison that we've all consumed, that we consume of this regularly, and it's a poison called Sin. Now, in the moment when we're actively engaged in sin, it's sweet, isn't it? It tastes good. Other people are doing it. It's enjoyable. And subtly, we, we don't really know what's happening. But the truth is, little by little, we are poisoning ourselves. It's sweet in the moment. But rest assured, sin is deadly. There are always consequences to sin. And, and even though the, the good news, right, and for those of you who've been part of the church for a while, you know this, the good news is there's hope for the poison of sin, right? In, in the gospel, right, this is what we preach often, right? It's amazing news that God came to earth, right? Jesus took on flesh, dwelled among men, lived among us. He, he, he lived the life we couldn't live and died the death we deserve because he came to deal with this problem of sin and take the penalty of sin upon himself. The good news of the gospel is you and I don't have to suffer the wrath of God and face the penalty for sin because Jesus was judged for us. Isn't that awesome? It's great news. That's the good news of the gospel, and we're so thankful for that. But here's the thing. Just because, as Christians, we've been saved from the penalty of sin doesn't mean that we've been saved from the presence of sin. Not yet, at least. 
Sin is still very active. It's alive and well. It's all around us and we can't escape from it, try as we might. We still carry around with us this body of sin, this sinful flesh. Paul, Paul talks about that, right? In, in the book of Romans, it's like this dead body strapped to him. He carries around with him everywhere he goes that wars against the spirit. We always have at all times, even in Christ, this constant inward battle against sin. It still tempts us. It still baits us. Sin still bids us to draw near. And I want you to know that if you yield to it and you continue and continue and continue in sin, there will be serious, serious consequences in your life. Sin is deadly. Sin is destructive. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your family. It can destroy your career. Sin always has consequences, which is why early on in the history of the church, there were some, some early leaders in the church that really tried to understand and, and, and and grab a hold of what they believe were the most significant deadly sins in the Bible. It started with a group known as the uh, Desert Fathers. These were men who chose to go out into the Egyptian wilderness and, and live as hermits, right? They wanted to retreat from society. These were actually the guys who started the monastic movement. Uh, this was in the third century. The Desert Fathers went out, and what they did was they studied the scriptures diligently. They poured over the scriptures, and they began to develop a list of what they felt like were the most deadly sins, and then some years later, uh, in the 5th century, a guy named John Cassian showed up. He took that list and he pared it down to eight deadly sins. And then eventually in 590 AD, uh, there was Pope Gregory who ended up taking the list and paring it down to seven. And the list that perhaps you're familiar with today, if you grew up in the Catholic Church, you know that this is talked about a little more regularly than maybe in other Protestant churches. But there's a list now of seven deadly sins that Pope Gregory uh, gave to the church. And this is how the list goes. Uh, the list of seven deadly sins begins with pride, envy, greed, sloth, lust, gluttony, and wrath. This is the list. And over the next couple months, what we're going to do here at Frank and Bible Church is we're going to take time individually to look at each one of these sins. And every single Sunday for the next couple months, we're going to examine one of these sins. And our goal is to encourage you and equip you to really pursue a life of freedom and victory over some of these sins that are the most deadly, the ones that really ensnare us, the ones that we're all susceptible to, the ones that drag us down. And you might be thinking right now, okay, Pastor Joe, I'm looking at the list and I'm feeling pretty good. You know, maybe, right, which by the way, we're talking about pride today, so this is for you if you're feeling pretty good. <laughs> I'm feeling all right though. You know, I maybe, maybe one or two of those are a little bit tricky, but I think for the most part, I'm doing pretty good. You might be thinking that. Or you might also be thinking, you know who really needs to hear that sin right there, and it's the person next to you. Maybe it's your spouse. Or maybe you know somebody here who you're like, oh boy, I hope so-and-so shows up this week so they can hear about this one. Maybe that's what you're doing in your head right now, and you're thinking, this, now, this whole series is not going to be relevant for me. Let me warn you, we are all susceptible to the power of sin. Each and every one of us can fall into any of these sins. And so instead of going through this series and really thinking, boy, so-and-so needs to hear this, why don't you take your finger and point it inward? I've shared before one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 139. It ends with this amazing prayer. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me and know my thoughts See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That is my hope and prayer. And I hope that that's your hope and prayer for yourself. That through this series, you would search your own heart. You would examine your heart and try to look at the deadly sin, right? This poison that lives within us and begin to try to work that out and uproot some of those things that maybe have a stronghold in your life. That's our hope through this series. And so if you want to join us on that journey and join me this morning, I'd encourage you to begin by opening your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, as we jump into the seven deadly sins. Now, if you didn't bring a Bible, that's all right. There should be a Bible in front of you. If you don't own a physical Bible, the Bible in front of you is yours to take home. We'd love for you to have it. Genesis is the very first book of the Bible, and we're in the third chapter this morning. And as you're turning there, I want to let you know, as I mentioned a second ago, our, our focus today is to look at the first sin on the list, the sin of pride. Now, this is the chief of all other sins. Right? This is the granddaddy of all other sins on the list. It's the sin of pride. And uh, you may, maybe were with us a few weeks ago, we actually talked about the topic of pride in the From Me to We series. 
And we're doing it again this morning. Now, why are we doing it so soon? Well, first of all, it's first on the list, and my OCD tells me I gotta do the first on the list. But also, because it's so important, right, we should start with this, but more, more than any of those things, the reason we're talking about pride today is because this guy needs to hear it. I need to hear about the topic of pride, and so I wanted to preach on it again because I think I need to hear it again. Uh, I think that for me, this is the one area on the list that more than anything else, has impacted my life recently and has affected my life and um, is something that I'm cognizant of. It's a struggle. And it's become even more increasingly, uh, I've become more aware of that in recent days. Uh, if it's okay, I just wanna share a brief personal story. So not too long ago, I was with my wife and we were just talking about things and somehow the topic of pride came up and we were talking. And my wife said something to me that was very, very impactful. Uh, she wasn't trying to be harsh. She was trying to be honest. What she shared with me was that she said, hey, when we first got married, one of the things I just loved about you is the fact that I looked at you and I felt like you were somebody who didn't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. You were somebody who I would have characterized as a pretty humble person. But she said, as we've been married for these years and I've looked at your life, she said, I don't know if I could say that as often today. You don't always look like the same person I married when it comes to the topic of pride. Now, when I heard that, the first thing I did was in my pride, I got real defensive, right? I got real defensive because that's what happens when someone calls you to the carpet over your sin. And in my heart, I, not, not necessarily to her, but in my mind and heart, I was thinking, oh, she's way off. But the more I stopped and the more I thought, search me, oh God, know my heart the more I realized that she was dead right. She was completely right. She was speaking the truth. Single guys out there, if you're looking to get married, let me just give you a little bit of advice here. Don't find a woman who tells you what you want to hear. Find a woman who tells you what you need to hear. The book of Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And I am just blessed to have a best friend in my wife who's not afraid to tell me the truth when she sees it. And I welcome that because I need someone looking into my life and speaking truth. Because so many people just tell me what I want to hear. She tells me what I need to hear. And when she told me that, man, I was wrecked in a good way. I was wrecked because I, I looked at my life and I said, man, I don't want to continue to become someone that I'm... I wasn't before. I don't want this to continue to fester and grow in my life. I want some freedom and deliverance from this. And so I'm thankful that she spoke that into my life. But man, it's hard, right? I've talked about this before. I, I'm up here for 40 minutes every Sunday. The lights are on. My job is to have attention on myself as I preach. And then you add on top of that the fact that the church has been doing pretty good. And that's a recipe for disaster when it comes to pride. I think a lot of Pastors wrestle with the issue of pride, and it makes sense. Charles Spurgeon, he's known as the Prince of Preachers, uh, one of the best preachers of, of his day and maybe any day. He had a church in England, and he was noted as saying a story once when he preached a really passionate message. I mean, he was really on fire, preaching with boldness and conviction and in clarity. And obviously, people were pretty impacted by his sermons. But on this particular Sunday, there was a woman who was so impacted by Charles Spurgeon's message that she made her way through the crowd and got up to him right after the message and said, I just want you to know, Pastor, that that message was so moving and so impactful. It was one of the best messages I've ever heard. And he responded by saying, thanks, I know. Satan told me just a few minutes ago. See, pride is one of those things that is so dangerous. And it's not okay, not for me, and not for anybody. And so my hope is that we can begin to deal with this destructive sin. And if, if you're anything like me, and you need to hear this today, my hope is that it's gonna be a blessing to you because pride is so, so deadly. Pride is the reason why the devil became the devil. Pride is the very first sin we read about in the Bible. In fact, the reason the world is so broken and messed up is because the sin of pride is what started it all. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at the very first sin in the Bible, the sin of pride. And our goal here as we unpack just a little bit of Genesis chapter 3 is for us to draw our attention to this section because what we want to look at, first of all, is the root of pride. Where does this come from? What is it in us that begins to, to act in such a way where we want to elevate ourselves? What is that? 
Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. And so if you're in Genesis 3, we're going to jump in there. Just want to give a little context. Remember, right, the first two chapters of Genesis, God creates everything. On the sixth day, he creates humans. Everything about humanity and God and our relationship is great because they're dwelling with God. They're walking. They're talking with him in the garden. Um, Everything is great. And then chapter 3 comes. And remember in chapter 3, the the background to this is God gave humans a warning. He said, you can eat from any tree in the Garden of Eden. It's all for you. But there's one tree in the midst of the garden that you shouldn't eat from. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. So eat everything else, just don't eat from that tree. That's the backdrop. And notice what happens now in the beginning of chapter 3. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Notice the subtle deception here. And the woman said to the servant, we may eat of the fruit trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, right here in the beginning of chapter 3, the serpent is setting a trap. He is laying a snare, right? He's setting the bait. Remember, Adam and Eve, they were created in a very special way. Of all the creatures that God made, God looked at humans and he said, Hey, you are my image bearers. I made you in my image after my likeness. Humans, inherently, we've been endowed with this sense of dignity. Uh, we, we, we bear the status of image bearers of God. It's in, in, intrinsically, we have importance. We have value. We've been crowned with glory and honor, it says in Psalm 8. Humans were made special. And yet here in the garden, what does the serpent subtly suggest? He says, oh, you were made special. Yeah, but you can be more. You can be even better. What does he say? You can be Like God. That right there is it. This is where it all begins. The root, the root of pride is this enticement that we can be something more. It's the lure of being elevated to a higher position. Deep down from one degree to another, all of us Even some of us who maybe are the most humble in the room, right, on a low level, we all still struggle at times with this desire, right, to to, to just be elevated a little more, to be esteemed in the eyes of others, to be admired by people. We all want to be more than we are. It's a deep yearning that lives within all our hearts. And sometimes it's, it's pretty innocent, at least for a while. It's not always something that's just overtly evil, Sometimes it starts so innocent. I think of just my childhood, my teenage years. There was a long period of time there where my only goal was to dunk a basketball. I wanted to dunk so bad, right? I played a lot of basketball growing up. I thought, man, if I can dunk a basketball, that's a big deal. So what I would do is I would work on jumping and all that. And then we had an adjustable hoop in our front um, front yard. So I'd set it to whatever like was, you know, kind of a, a stretch for me to get to. And I'd work on it. And eventually when I was able to dunk on that level, what I would do is I would raise it to the next level. But every time I got to a new level, I would try to have my parents watch. I wanted them to see the progress I was making because I was proud. I was excited at the progress I, I was making. So I would practice all the tra- time trying to dunk. Now, I don't... Um, I'm not able to dunk anymore unless you're talking about Oreos. I do a lot of dunking with Oreos. But the point is, it wasn't evil, but it was motivating to me. I was, I was proud of what I was able to do. And we teach our kids all the time, right? It's important to have a you know, sense of self-esteem, uh, to, to, to have confidence. That's a good thing, especially athletes, right? You want to think well of yourself. You don't want to just always think you're, you know, Nothing, garbage, you don't want to think that way. And so we often promote pride as a good thing, and I think in many ways it can, but here's the problem. When it becomes something that's it's not really natural anymore, when it becomes something unnatural, and we're trying to elevate ourselves to a place that we really aren't are, to be more than God created us, that's where we come into problems. When pride isn't something that's Checked when we can't keep it in check, but it goes unchecked and it grows and it festers, it germinates and becomes something else. That's where the problems really start. That's when pride becomes destructive. That's when it becomes sinful. And that's what we see here. The serpent creeps in 
He lays the bait, he sets the trap, and what do the human beings do? They fall for it. They're enticed by this idea that they could be something more than God created them to be. It's this unnatural desire that they have to be something more. And what happens? Well, the text goes on and it just simply says this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. There you have it. That's the first sin. All other sin, all other death, rebellion, evil, that can be traced back to this moment in the Garden of Eden where the root of pride was, was based on the desire to be something more, to be greater. And so now that we've seen the, the root, the next thing I want to look at, secondly, is the result. What happens when pride grows in our heart? What's the result of pride? Well, we know the result for Adam and Eve. It led toward death. God had given them the warning. They ate the fruit. Their hearts were filled with pride. And eventually, Adam and Eve died. Uh, They were exiled from the garden, removed from the presence of God, and sin and death reigned from that point forward. So pride was certainly destructive to Adam and Eve, but pride is destructive to a lot of people in the Bible. If you think about it, there are many stories of people who were destroyed by their pride. We see it in the story of the defeat of Pharaoh. We see it in the story of the demise of Saul. We see it in the story of the decline of Nebuchadnezzar. We see it in the story of the denial of Peter. Again and again and again, pride is something that causes destruction in people's lives. This is why the book of Proverbs, it warns us against pride. What does it say? Multiple times in the book of Proverbs, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. Here's the warning. It says, one's pride will bring him low. That's what it says in Proverbs 29.3. One of the most popular ones, Proverbs 16.18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. A lot of us, we grew up maybe hearing from King James English, right? Pride cometh before the fall. Many of us know that. But a lot of us, we we don't really think about that in the moment. I have a classic example of this in my own life. I've shared this story before, but uh, this is kind of a fun one. So several years ago, my first year here, in fact, 11 years ago, almost, um, almost to the day, I was hired here. But originally, I was hired as the worship leader. And so we had another pastor at the time. I was the worship leader. And that first year went pretty well. But when it came time for Christmas, uh, that happened to be a year where Christmas Day was a Sunday morning, which meant we had church. But we do a big Christmas Eve service also. So I knew that the big service was Christmas Eve, and then there's going to be a lot less people on Sunday morning on Christmas Day. And because I wanted to give the worship team a break, I didn't want them showing up on Christmas Eve and putting all this time and then coming in in the morning and having to do worship, you know, early on Christmas Day, I thought, why don't I just give them a break? We'll do a big service on Christmas Eve, and then Christmas morning, I'll do an acoustic, like an acoustic set, just myself and a guitar. Make it real simple. So Christmas morning shows up. Uh, I'm there. There's a pretty decent group of people, but it's not a ton of people. But I'm leading worship. Things are going well. And then right before the pastor came out to preach, I picked a, a really good one, right? Oh, holy night. Anybody who's, who's done vocals know that's, a, that's one where you can really shine, right? So it's a pretty big vocal song. So I pick Oh Holy Night, and I'm playing, and I'm kind of like, hey, it sounds kind of good, you know, as I'm singing. Starting to kind of fill up with pride a little bit. Sounds good. And then it gets to the point in the song, right, where it really builds. Oh, night divine, you hold that note out, right? So what I'm doing, I'm, I'm conjuring my inner Josh Groban in that moment, right? I'm really milking the vibrato. I'm feeling it, right? It's, it's like I'm thinking, man, this is really good. And I get to the point in the song where I kind of strum it out, and I'm going to hold that vocal note. And when I go for the note, right, it's just me and the mic and nobody else around. I go for the note, and it was the worst my voice had ever cracked in my entire life. It was terrible. So thankful we didn't have live stream back in the day. So terrible. And the problem was I couldn't even blame it on the rest of the team. Like I look around, nobody's there, nobody's there. It's just this guy and the mic and everybody's just kind of staring at me. And I thought in that moment, before the song was done, the verse came to mind, pride comes before the fall. And I thought, hey, what an idiot I am. I thought I was so great and I completely biffed it. And that's a perfect example. This is the the point, right? Except a lot of times it's more extreme. That's a funny example, but the truth is it's not always very funny. We think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We elevate ourselves. We begin to have our hearts filled with pride and often terrible things happen. And so if you're somebody like me who naturally struggles with pride, what do we do about it? 
What do we do about this problem of pride that dwells in our hearts? What do we do to try to avoid facing the destruction of whatever it is in your life that pride could destroy? What do we do with that pride there? Well, I think that that now leads to our third section. We've seen, first of all, the root. We understand that that, that pride comes from a place where we want to be elevating ourselves above where we really should be. We know what the root is. We've seen now the result, that pride can be something that's very destructive in our lives. So what do we do about it? How do we tackle this problem? Well, thirdly, and very simply, I want to look at now the remedy to pride. What is the remedy to pride? What is the solution? What is the antidote? Well, the ultimate antidote and solution, I believe, to the problem of pride is not thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but having a right understanding of who we are. It's having a sense of knowing exactly the type of person that we are. Uh, Paul talks to the Galatian church and he says this, anyone who thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. The warning here is to have a mindset that's accurate about self. Not inflated, but true and clear. We aren't supposed to think of ourselves more highly than we should, but we are to cultivate by God's grace and through the enablement of God's spirit, we're to cultivate this heart and a mindset that's filled with humility. Humility is really the antidote. That is the remedy to the problem of pride. Now, the word humility, it actually is a Latin word that comes uh, comes from the Latin humilitas. The Latin word humilitas comes from another Latin word, which is humus, and that Latin word means dirt, or soil, or earth, or ground. That's where the word humility comes from. So obviously something that's low. But when you think about that for a moment, literally pride is the elevation of self above where we should be, but humility, right? This is the thing that keeps us grounded. It's what helps us to see clearly who we truly are. To have a mindset of humility is seeing ourselves the way we should see ourselves. And the truth is, everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we can do, our abilities, all that stuff, all of that comes from where? From the God who's gifted us with everything. It comes from above. Everything you have came from the Lord. This is why the prophet Jeremiah, he talks about boasting. He says, thus says the Lord, don't let the wise man boast in his wisdom. Don't let the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. When we boast, when we brag about things, we should be bragging about the one who gave us everything that we have. Do you know him? Do you understand him and what he's done in your life? Do you know the one who created you? Do you know the one who gifted you, who's given you all that you have? Your life, your job, your money, your appearance, your family, your possessions, your home, your intelligence, your kids, your athletic ability, your sense of humor, your style, your gifts, and your abilities, all those came from God, not from you. Everything you have came from him. Do you know the one who loves you so much, so much, that he was willing to humble himself, to clothe himself in sinful flesh, He was without sin, but he clothed himself in humanity. In the appearance of sinful flesh, he clothed himself. And he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Do you know him? Do you know the one who took the path of humility for you, for your sake and for my sake? If anybody's going to receive glory or praise, it should be him. He's the one who deserves to be exalted He's the one who deserves to be praised, not you and not this guy. You see, as we draw this message to a close, I want to challenge you. So many of us, we want to be elevated. We want to be esteemed. We want to be admired. We want to elevate ourselves above where we should be. We want the spotlight. We want to be more. We want to be like God. But man, that mindset is destructive. It's dangerous. In the moment, man, it tastes so sweet, doesn't it? When people talk about how great you are, that tastes sweet. It feels like it's nourishing. But the truth is, it's deadly. It's a poison. So what if we made a change? What if in this church, we decided to think differently about ourselves, 
but others? What if we decided to make a change? My goal this morning is I want to challenge you to approach life with a sense of humility. I want to challenge you by God's grace and through God's spirit to approach life differently. I don't want to just challenge you. I want to challenge me. This guy right here needs this. This has been a battle for a long time, and I don't want it to be a battle anymore. What if I decided to make a change? And you decided to make a change. Instead of boasting about self, instead of bragging about self, Instead of trying to make much of self, what if you did something different? Here's the big idea. It is so simple. But what if we decided to just make much of Jesus? What if in your life and my life, we just decided to make much of him? You know, we've been talking a little bit lately as leadership here. Uh, It's summer, which is great, because hopefully we're going to feel a little bit of breathing room here. But the last Sunday, uh, last week was our biggest regular Sunday ever. And we've seen a lot of growing pains. You probably know about the parking situation and classrooms are getting kind of full. So we're talking as a team about ways that we can try to accommodate some of the growth. And as we've been doing that, you know, lots of different ideas we're tossing out there. And one of the things that I really want to drive home, especially after this week, is whatever we do here, whatever we do as a church, let's just make much of Jesus. Let's make sure that that is the thing that keeps things in balance with whatever we do, that it's all about him. Because it would be very easy for me to try to make more things about me. And maybe you're the same way. It's really easy to make things about you, to make much of self. But what if we were to make much of Jesus? How might might the world around us be changed if Jesus was the thing that we focused on all the time? Make much of him. Boast about Jesus. Brag about Jesus. Talk about Jesus, elevate Jesus, give praise to Jesus, honor Jesus, celebrate Jesus, shine the spotlight on Jesus, give Jesus the credit. Make much of Jesus. How might the world be impacted by that? I love the story of John the Baptist. Do you know that he was the greatest prophet that ever lived according to Jesus? John the Baptist was like a stud in his day. People would gather from far and wide to hear John preach and to see him teach and to come and be baptized. John was like hot stuff. And yet when John the Baptist set his eyes on Jesus, what was his response? He said, I'm not even worthy to tie this dude's shoe. So John said, Jesus, like he's the real focus. Don't focus on me. I'm not worthy to even be in his presence. Don't focus on me. John said, I must be, he must become greater, I must become less. I want that to be my heart and my mindset. I want that for me, and I want that for you. He must become greater, and I must become less. Let's be a community that makes much of Jesus. So when you leave here, right, and you're going you know, to spend the summer up at the cabin, and you got your boat and all these things, and people are complimenting you, like, make much of Jesus. When people look at how gifted you are in your career or your skills or abilities, right, make much of Jesus. When people talk about how wonderful your, kid, your kids are, make much of Jesus, right? Sports happen this summer. How, mo- how many of us, right, we put our identity in our kids when they're playing sports, don't we? We do it. Our kid does really good out there, and it's kind of like, yeah, that's me right there, right from their old man, chip off the old block. We, we do that. Make much of Jesus. Make much of Jesus in everything you do and see how the world will be impacted. May this be the mindset, your mindset and mine in the church by God's grace and through the enablement of God's spirit with our whole heart. Let's be a community that makes much of Jesus. Let's be filled with a sense of humility, not pride, humility, and make much of him in everything we do. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. I look at my life and I want to change. And I know that, Lord, there is the power to change through the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what Pentecost Sunday, which is today, is all about. It's the fact that I have the presence of the living God dwelling within my members. You're so good and so gracious and so faithful. And so, Lord, I can't manufacture Uh, this humility. I know that this is something that you bring about in me and through me. And Lord, I pray that you would conform me more and more into the image of your son, the humble one. 
May I have the mind of Christ and may all here have the mind of Christ. May we make much of you, much of your son Jesus in everything we do. And may you use that testimony of how great Jesus is to impact this region for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray for that, Lord. Pray for this church. Help me with a challenging, destructive problem of pride in my heart. Uproot it. And I pray that through the rest of this series, Lord, as we walk through these seven deadly sins, this is kind of a a good series, but it's a little bit of a a downer for the summer, that we're going to look at all these different things that live in our hearts that cause problems. I pray that we wouldn't focus on the wrong things, but we focus on the right thing. That, Father, that by your grace, you're helping us. You're making us more and more like your son, Jesus. That you who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Praise you for that. Man, that is awesome. We don't deserve the credit for anything good we do. We want to give it all to you. For your glory, for your praise, for your honor, for your fame. May we make much of Jesus in this place. It's in his name we pray.